Hello everyone, my name is Roy Wood and I'm the Chief of Interpretation at Katmai National Park and Preserve. Hi, and I'm Mike Pitts. I'm the Media Ranger here at Katmai. And we want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our latest Ranger Chat. And uh, today's a little bit different location than we've done in the past. We are at the mouth of the river. We'll step to the side for just a little bit here so you can see. You might be able to hear, I'm not sure if you can, but there are bears walking below us right now. So this is a, a really great spot to be at this time of the year. Bears right now are fattening up on, and I'll see if I can maybe get one of the bears that's nearby right now. You might be able to see her walking in the water. Bears right now are fattening up on the dead and dying salmon that drift down to the mouth of the Brooks River. Most of the salmon are spawning upstream. However, at the mouth of the Brooks River is where they collect after they spawn. So salmon will run into the Brooks River, um, and this is a one-way trip for them. They're spawning, and they're dying, and that's it for them, and they're drifting downstream, and this is where the bears know they can find an easy meal. They're not really chasing the fish very actively at this time of the year. They're mostly looking um, to pick up anything that really just can't swim away. I know for a lot of our uh, frequent web users that this is uh, nothing new to them. They've been seeing uh, the bear activity here for quite some time, and um, are, are sort of attuned to it. But I know today, because of the connection with Disney Nature, that we have a lot of perhaps uh, new bear watchers that are joining us. And we want to send out a special thank you to all of you for joining in. Some people may wonder uh, what the connection is between Count My National Park, the National Park Service, and Disney Nature. I think the Explore connection should be pretty clear, but this uh, connection with Disney Nature is a, is a new one for us. And the reason for that is for a couple of years, uh, Disney Nature has been filming um, a feature documentary in the park that's going to be called Disney Nature Bears, and uh, that will be premiering in April. And as part of that, they will be donating uh, proceeds from the first week's ticket sales to the National Park Foundation. And uh, those donations will be used for a variety of purposes. Might be habitat restoration somewhere, might be bear education, um, research, lots of, lots of ways that money could be used. I just swallowed a bug in case you were wondering what just happened there. Um, and the uh, so anyway, we welcome all the, the Disney Nature folks to the chat today, and hopefully we'll have some good questions that we can we can answer for you, and hopefully it'll help you make that stronger connection with the bears here in Katmai, or perhaps the bears uh, closer to home. You know, we have brown bears around the world in the northern hemisphere. Uh, their their range isn't as extensive as it used to be, but they still exist in a, in a, a lot of countries around the northern hemisphere. And where we don't have brown bears, of course, we have uh, black bears and, and other varieties of bears in, in other locations. So, uh, wonderful opportunities around the world to make connections with bears. And hopefully, this this uh, connection with the, the webcams that you're making here, uh, or some of the other cams that, that Explore runs throughout the year, will help strengthen that bond that you may have with uh, bears that might be closer to home for you. And Katmai contains, um, I had to step away for just a little bit, but um, so I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but Katmai contains some of the highest uh, densities of bears anywhere in the world. There are, on our last estimate, there were about 2,200 bears within the park boundaries here. And to give you uh, an idea of how many bears that actually is, Katmai is about 4 million acres in size. You want to compare that to another national park in Alaska that many people are familiar with, Denali National Park. Denali National Park is about 2 million acres bigger than Katmai. And Denali just has a few hundred bears. So the densities here at Katmai are many times greater than what you have at other places in North America. So we have extremely high densities of bears here, and this is one of the best places in the world to come and see these animals. So the way the chat will work today, especially again for you new folks, is that you'll post your, your questions online either on the explore.org web pages uh, where you might be watching this, or you can also send it as a, as a tw Twitter uh, a tweet, and it will be uh, hashtag AskRangerRoy. And uh, when they see those, those questions coming in, what they will do is they will forward them on to our Skype account here, which will appear on an iPad. So if you see us looking down, what we're doing is uh, looking for a question. And so far, no questions have come in, which sometimes means nobody's asking any questions. But with the group of people that watch the cams, I hardly think that's the case. What I think is probably happening here is that there is uh, some sort of a delay with uh, with 
Skype, which sometimes happens. It's amazing that the tech works, you know, ever in a place like this. So we're usually not surprised when things don't work according to um, our plan, which is to have those questions come in on the uh, on the Skype. So uh, what we'll uh, go ahead and do is uh, just give you a, a little bit of a rundown of what the normal behavior would be uh, throughout Brooks Camp throughout the year, sort of in a general sense, but then a little more detail for this time of the year. And uh, the, the, this area is known for its bears, of course, as Mike has, has said, and uh, also for its sockeye salmon run. And the sockeye salmon run is part of the largest run of sockeye salmon on the planet. And it arrives typically around the first part of July, maybe the end of, of June, every year at Brooks Camp. And the Salmon will course up the streams, and that's when the bears first arrive. And that spectacle of seeing the bears fish at the fall is the uh, is the probably the most iconic image that we have in in Katmai National Park is of the bear perched at the lip of the falls, catching the salmon as they jump up. That's a very short window of time. That happens typically only in um, in July, but the 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 salmon. continue to, to stay in the area. Bear numbers dwindle off a little bit in August, but then as those salmon spawn and die, which is what's happening right now, many dead fish out there and some spawning once we have an airplane taking off. So I'm not sure if you can hear me. I might just pause for a second here. Yeah, and as is, um, I, th I think you'll be able to hear me now as the airplane leaves. So the salmon um, begin to spawn and die. Of course, the bears are still going to be feeding on them. The salmon has to be pretty darn rotten before a bear actually uh, stops feeding on it. So if you were able to walk the Brooks River at this time of the year, or really any of the salmon streams in the area, you'd be able to find the area littered with pieces of salmon. Sometimes it's a whole carcass. Many times it's just a, a, the jaw bones or some of the guts inside of it, the, the parts of the fish that the bears really don't prefer to eat. In most instances, instances though, they're going to be eating the whole thing unless, uh, unless they're very, very well fed. Only well fed bears will eat the, the fattiest parts of the fish, the skin, the brains, and the eggs because they're looking to get the most calories. But at this time of the year, most of the fish is going to be consumed because these bears really need to fatten up. Um, they need to put on more pounds before they go into their dens. And that, that really begins in November. So if some of you have been watching the cameras like just before this chat started, you uh, were, were witness to some interesting bear behavior. And specifically what we had right in front of the Lower River platform is we had two adult bears uh, playing now it may not have looked like playing entirely from from your perspective because you don't have the sound for one thing to hear that they're not roaring and, and it, you know it doesn't sound really ferocious just but they were they were definitely playing and the first question we have Mike is okay. can we identify the two bears that were playing and and basically you know why were they playing how can they get away with that <laughs> Um, I, I could recognize one of them at least. Um, one of them is a young adult male, um, and he's numbered 32. Uh, uh, and he's nicknamed Chunk, just because he has a really, really big butt. Even in June, when a lot of the bears are, are fairly thin, it seems like he has a pretty big, pretty big hind end on him. Uh, and the other bear I wasn't able to really recognize. We don't often see uh, adult bears play with one another, but they do, and that probably signifies that they're well-fed animals. Uh, bears don't want to really expend a lot of energy. We're looking over our shoulders over here because there's a bear walking on the ground just below us. <laughs> um, so if you see us turning our heads every once in a while, that's because we like to keep track of the bears here and there. Um, we have this bad habit, all the park rangers here, of not making eye contact with the person we're talking to because we spend so much time on the ground with the bears that we're 
always looking around whenever we're outside, making sure that a bear doesn't sneak up on us. And even though we're on the safety of the platform right now, old habits are hard to break. So that's why you'll see this shifty look uh, as we're as we're looking around, and making sure. It, it, it's hard just to ignore them too. I mean, we want to see them just as much mm -hmm. as everybody else. Uh, but to get back to the question, I, the bears are, you know, when they're when they're playing like that, they're they're generally well fed animals, and they can afford to expend a little bit of that extra energy. It depends a lot on their dispositions as well, too. Younger bears play with each other more often than adult bears, but you there are still some adult bears that do tend to want to partake in a, in a good wrestling match here and there, and that was quite an extended wrestling match that we ended up seeing i think it went on for maybe close to an hour or something like that yeah we were on the other side of the river waiting to come across and we couldn't get over to this location <laughs> because those bears are wrestling with one another right down below <laughs> and uh it's it's a really uh fun opportunity to to get to see that behavior here at the brooks river and one of the things that makes this place really cool to come and watch bears or just cat in general is that you get to see pretty much all of the bear behaviors um, that you want to see, they happen here along the river. So oh, you can watch for them to, to f uh, look for uh, fish in the river. You can see the different fishing techniques. Uh, you can also see them engage in play or just ignore one another or compete with mates too. So all of the, the whole gamut of bear behavior is uh, is possibly observed here along Brooks River. Okay, well, we were waiting for another question to come in. Maybe the tech is, is failing us again oh, at, should, the, at the yeah, moment. But. I should say that, um, you know, the person who asked that question also was wondering if it was a, a, a sow and a yearling. And it, it definitely was not. Those were two adult bears. One of them was a little bit smaller than another one. And females will play with their cubs on occasion, but most of the, uh, when you, when you, we were looking at those two bears, those were just two adult bears, and they happen to come together and just nose one another. It seemed like um, they were, are familiar with one, one another, checking each other out. Um, and then they started a good wrestling match. When you're watching on the webcams and you want to see whether or not or, or try to tell the difference between a fight, for instance, and wrestling matches. First of all, the wrestling matches, the play fighting, is going to be much more common than the actual real fighting. Look for it to be, the play fighting to be less intense. Um, you probably... would be able to notice with those two bears that were playing, um, is that when they... They do bite each other or sort of cuff one another. Um, it doesn't seem to be, uh, as, you know, they're not really intending to cause injury to the other bears. So that's something that you can look for. Just look for a lack of intensity with that. If you, if we had sounds with the cams, you would probably be able to hear uh, in, in a fight situation that a lot of the bear, I mean, they would be roaring at one another um, prior to actually fighting. So they'll be body posturing quite a bit. They'll be roaring at one another, and then they'll be engaging in fighting. And the biting and the clawing in those fights is going to be much more intense. However, we rarely see that. Uh, throughout the summer, I might record uh, a few hundred instances of when bears interact with one another, and I <laughs> will record it, it, over those few hundred times just a few, uh, just a few fights. Um, so it's a very rare event to actually see that. So if you do see bears, you know, uh, engaging it with one another for a considerable period of time, it's most often play. So we did get another question in, and that is, uh, do the bears ever eat trout or is the preference to eat salmon? And the, the preference is definitely to eat salmon. Uh, I have seen on, on numerous occasions a bear catch a trout, maybe take a, a little half-hearted nibble of it and then just drop it and go back to fishing for salmon again. And uh, that's not to say that, 
that they won't eat trout because I have seen them eat trout, but most of the time when they've caught a trout, what I what I have seen is is uh, especially if salmon are around, a uh, uh, general distaste for for the the trout, and they drop it, go right back to fishing for salmon. They sort and, of wonder, well, what is this this weird <laughs> fish that I just picked up? It's just an off taste. And you know, for the, for the bears, it's uh it's not so much about the taste. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they don't they don't crave for foods like we do necessarily for taste. They crave them for the nutrients. And somewhere deep in their genetic code, it tells them to, whenever possible, eat the things that are are the the, the most caloric. They're they're particularly particularly looking for high fat foods because they're trying to get fat. They're not trying to get healthy. You know, like like we are. They're not trying to get thin and lean. They are trying to put on as much fat as they possibly can because that's what's going to get them. Uh, through through the winter, so they don't want to expend their their efforts trying to to eat a fish that doesn't have the high fat content like a sockeye salmon does. So, given the preference, they'll take the salmon. If nothing else is around, sure they may eat trout, but it is definitely not their preference. So let me make sure there was, uh, or do they eat whatever they catch? Well, yeah, again, uh, if if that's all they can find, sure they'll they'll eat it, uh, but not the preference. It really does depend on how hungry um, the bear is. And I we'll have to apologize too. We're going to be rubbing our face once in a while. You may be able to see the the, the, yeah, the black flies that are um, coming around. And, you know, we had a frost this morning and I thought most of these would die off, but we still have a, a lot of black flies around right now. Uh, and uh, locally, they're, they're commonly called white socks. Um, so if you ever hear us throw out that term, that's what we were talking about. And if you're keeping score, I've eaten one so far. How many of you eaten? None, none today. None? No. Okay. <laughs> we have to be careful. If we talk too long and then we breathe in, that's when we suck them right down. And, and I still have one clinging for life at the back of my throat right now. So if you'll, I'm sometimes going, <laughs> trying to get it out of there. Uh, so, but each, um, you know, it, uh, whether or not a bear is going to, you know, be eating a trout versus a salmon, it does depend on the bear. It depends on how hungry they are, of course. They, Younger bears, I've seen younger bears, sub-adult bears, maybe they, they can't compete for the best fishing spots here along Brooks River, especially in July. They're going to be picking up basically any parts of fish that they can scavenge. The really big dominant bears that can afford to defend the best fishing spots up at Brooks Falls, they're going to be the ones that can't afford when the salmon are really running thick in the river to only eat the fattiest parts of the fish. And a lot of a bear's behavior really does boil down to the economics of energy. What energy? What fishing strategy, for instance, is going to give them the most profit and calories? Because again, they're they're economists. They're looking to make a profit, but their currency is not money. It's not dollars and, and bills, or excuse me, uh, bills and and coins. But it's actually it's actually calories. So any strategy that you have, or any really behavior that you see bears partaking in, that's probably. Um, based on a successful strategy for them to gain as much fat as possible and make a big profit before they go to their dens. Next question is a great one uh, that I always I always like talking about this one when when we get it. But uh, you can answer, it, Mike. It's sure. Uh, when the cubs grow up and come across one another, do they recognize one another as siblings, or are they perhaps a little more uh, tolerant of one another as adults? They do recognize one. I think one another as siblings. Uh, at least it seems like. <laughs> Bears are extremely smart animals, just as smart as any domestic dog. And, you know, of course, we don't know for sure because we can't go down and we can't ask the bear, hey, do you know that bear over there? Because we think that bear's your sibling. Um, and do you recognize it? Of course, we can't ask them that. But it does seem like they recognize one another. And all of these, uh, not I shouldn't say all of them, but many of the bears here in the Brooks River encounter one another repeatedly year after year after year. And they recognize each other by sight. They recognize each other by scent, too, because that... <laughs> is certainly uh, their most powerful sense, is their sense of smell. So they're often recognizing each other through those, those two things. As far as whether they show a greater tolerance for one another, that's something that we can't really say for sure. Uh, I'm willing to say pro maybe in some instances, but in, in most instances, no. In fact, in a bear's world, they're looking for only, they're only looking out for one one bear, and that's themselves. They're only looking for themselves. And in, in fact, this, this summer, I was up at Brooks Falls watching some bears in the evening during my time off, and there were two bears fishing at the falls, and they were thought, these bears are thought to be siblings. One of the bears is a bit bigger and a bit more dominant than the, than the other bear, and they're both adult males. 
that other bear, uh, the bigger one of the sibling pair, he came in and he pushed his brother right out of the, the best fishing spot up at Brooks Falls. So again, he wasn't going to wait his turn to catch fish at that spot. He, again, he's looking out for only himself. So that's an instance that maybe shows that uh, they don't really have a greater level of tolerance for one another, even though they happen to be but siblings. If, if you think about that, if that selfishness extends all the way to the time when they're they're in the dens and just being born. You know, they don't share the the, the milk with their Oh, absolutely. Siblings, absolutely. They, if, if you're the, yeah. if you're slightly larger, slightly stronger, slightly more aggressive than, than your uh, litter mates, you grab on to the teat that has the highest milk flow and you don't want to give that up for, for any reason. And we see it here all the time with, uh, with like, uh, you know, bead nose has three cubs and, and the runt, if it's not in there fighting, trying to get that fish, the second mother brings it ashore, it's not going to stand a chance because the other two much larger siblings are not going to share that. They uh, they really look out for themselves. And I'm not sure which way the cams are really pointed right now, but I did just catch a glimpse of um, number 409 and her three yearling cubs. So if they're on the cams and you're watching them, the cubs are very blonde, and you'll see that there are two larger ones and there's one smaller one. So there is a, there is a high level of competition within the litter. Just like some people, some bears grow slower than others. Maybe they don't, uh, the other, the, the smaller one of that litter just doesn't have the genes that allow it to grow as fast as the other two. But definitely the other two seem to be dominating uh, the food resources more than that, that smaller bear. So they're not sharing with, with uh, sister uh, or brother. They're looking out for only themselves. So um, I just referred to a bear called Bead Nose. And you referred to a bear called 409. Oh, oh, oh yes. Yeah, I have a bad habit <laughs> of using numbers. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you're confused uh -huh. about all the, the numbers and, and names, we have two ways that we can help you. Uh, one, if you go to the National Park Service webpage at uh, nps.gov slash katm, or you can also just go to go.nps.gov slash bearcam. Uh, it'll take you to the Bear Cam pages on the National Park Service site, and you can download a book, a PDF, it's free, that will list most of the commonly seen bears uh, around Brooks Camp, and it'll give you their names and numbers, and tell you a little bit about their life history. Or if you have an iPad and, and you prefer to have an iBook, you can go uh, to iTunes and do a search for Brown Bears of Brooks River, and then you can, and I probably won't be able to show this too much reflection, but you can get this book, which has... Um, more photos, more information, some videos that'll help you identify. Both of those are free, and if you get addicted to watching the bears here and want to learn more about them, that's a great way to uh, to, to learn a little more about each of those those bears. Um, it's not every bear again, but it are the ones that uh, it does include the ones that we see more commonly. And I know another question came in, and I already forgot what it was. Oh. Uh, Perhaps we weren't very clear. The, the two bears that were fighting, we know that one, or we believe that one was uh, nicknamed Chunk. The other one we don't know because we were on the other side of the river and didn't have a great view of it. So it's possible that we know who the bear is. We just couldn't identify it. And they were performing, and they're both adult uh, bears. One's just bigger than the other one. And they were uh, doing play fighting, which is not incredibly common amongst adult bears. But if you have adult bears that have a good healthy fat layer and they know there's lots of food in the river and they're currently full they could either sleep started fishing right away so um, you know once there's in, in some space in their bellies they're going to try to fill it up as much as they can yep it's sort of yeah. like us when you're hungry you know the, you don't think about going out and playing a game of tennis you think about uh going and finding something to eat so bears the same way and we did get some other questions in yeah, so uh, a couple of questions, and they're sort of related to um, one another. Uh, when will the bears go into hibernation? Okay. okay. Oh, um, yep. Yeah, so the bears will go into hibernation mostly toward the very end of October and the first part of November if you are a female with cubs. And then beginning that time but extending much later, single bears and especially that it's time to go so it's not set in stone when they go and it's not it's not just because it's cold it's not just because it started to snow it's a combination of all of these things and the availability of food you know hibernation is a way that they can beat the winter where there's nothing around really to eat uh, aside from the the large run of salmon we nuts or moths eating the white bark pines in uh in in yellowstone you know they they um 
they take advantage of those seasonal food sources and when those seasonal food sources become scarce or non-existent that's what triggers them to go into hibernation so around here when the salmon uh, pickings become so sparse in the river that they may not go into their their dens until much later like we have seen them in december wandering around uh, in, in, in King Salmon. And I know in, in um, black bears and, and, and bears in other locations have, some cases don't even go into hibernation. There's just ample food resources throughout the winter and the every year, you know, not eating, not urinating, not defecating, uh, living solely on fat, yet coming out without losing muscle mass and putting on a third of their body weight in, in the summer and the fall without getting heart disease or joint problems. So really spectacular. And there's so much to talk about in, in a certain date or when they've eaten enough. And, and I, we kind of just got to that. Um, but uh, one, the next question is sort of about the, uh, the actual structure of the den itself um, and what covers the den. Do bears let snow seal themselves inside of the den? And what happens to old dens when they're done with them? Before we, before he answers that, I want to try something here with this with the camera. Um, people always ask us where the bear's den, and most of the time we can't show you because we're sitting in my cabin. Um, but behind me, right here, oh, looking the wrong way, there is a mountain. That is Mount Dumpling. A lot of the bears at Brooks Camp will go up and den on uh, the slopes of Mount Dumpling, pretty far up there. That's where they prefer to go. And if you watch Mike's uh, video that he's recorded and, and posted on Flickr, uh, you can see him going into one of the dens up there. So I'm going to spin around this way so you can see another mountain about the same location. I'm going to get this mirror thing right once for all. That's Mount Lagorce. They also will den on Mount Lagorce. And then I'm going to spin around here. And this one might be hard to pick out. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a lot of... There we go. There. <laughs> that is Katolanat. A lot of bears will den on Katolanat. And then the other mountains around here, you can't really see some trees are in the way. But those are the primary uh, mountains in this area that the bears at Brooks Camp go to. It is not a really long walk. They are not hiking 60 miles away to go den, uh, at least based on some studies that were done here in the 70s. They are going to these mountains that sort of fringe the Brooks Camp, Brooks River area. And as far as I know, the um, the bears basically let themselves get snowed in. So up the, their den, if you haven't ever seen a bear den, at least for brown bears, and bears can use a wide variety of terrain um, and materials to, to make their dens. But here in Katmai, the bears are digging their dens on steep hillsides. They're not known to use tree cavities or rock crevices. They're basically just going straight into the hillsides. Um, excavating a tunnel that goes back several feet and it's just big enough for them to turn themselves around in uh, and they basically let themselves get snowed in so to get back to that question um, do bears let snow seal themselves yes um, and there's no um, there's no hole or anything like that that they happen to maintain that allows you know gas to escape in and out um, their rate their breathing rate actually is very very slow when they're in their dens. They, if I remember correctly, it may be just one or, or two breaths per minute. So it's very, very slow. They're not really worried about suffocating. They're not taking in that much oxygen and they're not really exhaling that much carbon dioxide. So it seems like they're, even though they may have several feet of snow on, t on at the entrance of their dens, they're not gonna suffocate because of that. Um, and what happens to the dens after they're done with them? Basically the dens are just abandoned after they come out in the springtime and eventually over time they end up collapsing uh, on themselves. The bears here in Katmai are not known to reuse dens from year to year. So each year they're going to be excavating a new den in the hillsides up on, on, on Mount Dumpling right next to us over here. And there are places up there that's really good denning habitat. Steep slopes, fairly high elevations here uh, for Katmai anyway. They, they like to go up to uh, up around 1,300 feet in elevation on average. And that probably gives them uh, access to really reliable snowpack. Because down here where we are along Knack Knack Lake, we're not really at a high elevation at all. We're probably about 60 feet or so right here. And if we get a big storm blowing off the Pacific Ocean, even in the middle of January, we can sometimes have uh, thaw uh, temperatures. Temperatures above freezing, we can get some rain and things like that. So if you're a bear and you're denning down at this elevation, 
then you don't want to ex be exposed to this wide fluctuations of temperatures, especially if it warms up and then it cools down to 30 below zero. That's going to put some hardship on you that you don't have to. So they'll go up in elevation to try to get to a place where they get uh, to a more reliable snowpack. And afterwards, again, once they leave the den, it, that's it for the den. It's just home for them for just a few months. The next question that we have is, are we planning on returning to Katmai's Rangers next year? And uh, we, we, uh, you know, we get that a lot. I think a lot of people know park rangers tend to travel around a lot and, and visit a lot of different national parks. But I, I think it's safe to say that Mike and I have no um, plans to not be here next year. But you just never know. Uh, you know, we, we, I'm not saying we're leaving the door wide open for, for either of us to leave. But, you know, right now, I think we're planning on being here. Unless I get fired. And I, said, I think I said that. In one <laughs> you said that other. last time, right? Last time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said, yeah, unless Roy fires me. Uh, let's see. Do the bears wake up at all during hibernation or do they continuously sleep all winter? Well, with bears, they don't actually wake up. They sleep continuously all winter, although they can be woken up fairly easily. Unlike uh, other hibernating mammals, like a ground squirrel. A ground squirrel, for instance, needs a long period of time before it can it can boost its metabolism once again to be in a waking state and be active. But a bear can be aroused fairly quickly, sometimes within a matter of minutes itself. However, they don't wake up typically. Um, they, I, we don't know too much about the habits of brown bears within our dens because, you know, we're not in the dens with them, of course. So really what little we know about bears and their hibernation um, habits comes from studies done on maybe black bears in captivity, for instance, uh, run through universities and things like that. So the bears are really not known to arouse themselves during the winter time and, and wake up, although they do sometimes shiver. I mean, I think that's been um, documented and that may help to maintain muscle mass when they're in, inside of the den. One really remarkable thing about bears, and this is different than all other mammals as far as I know, is that bears don't, they don't, of course, when they're in their dens, they don't eat, they don't drink, and they don't go to the bathroom either. So they basically are, are subsisting solely on their stored body fat for for five, six months or more. And that's really a remarkable adaptation that no other mammals share with them. So a, a ground squirrel, for instance, a, a chipmunk, they're probably going to get up. They're going to go to the bathroom, things like that. But bears will not do that at all. Yeah, so just, you know, to, to make it clear, they they don't they don't wake up as a, on a as a regular basis, on a regular basis, but they can be awakened. So if you have really, really warm days that, that occur in February, that might rouse them and they might poke their heads out, take a look around, but they don't wake up on a regular basis in order to feed, to urinate, to defecate, uh, but they can be awakened. Yeah, and, um, and people can awaken them too. So, yeah. um, you know, I usually stay away from areas where bears den in the wintertime, partly because they're, it's usually far away from where I'm living in the wintertime. But even in the spring, I want to stay away because I just don't want to stumble upon a, a, a sleeping bear, of course. And um, I think it's about halfway through the program, so maybe we could uh, reintroduce ourselves if anyone's uh, joining us late. And uh, my name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I'm the, the media ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. And my name is Roy Wood, and I'm the chief of interpretation for Katmai National Park and Preserve. And we're both here at Brooks Camp at the mouth of the, the Brooks River in the heart of, of Katmai National Park. And uh, behind us, I don't know if we have any bears. Not like there now. Now. We have a bear way over here uh, on the on the lake shore, which is out of camera view. You won't see that, but this is an area that has a lot of bear activity this time of the year. As the salmon are dying after spawning, the bears are coming and feeding on them. It's very easy pickings for for all the bears. All they have to do is walk around, sniff the air, and they can find a meal pretty easily. And if you are just joining us and you're not sure how to ask questions, you can ask questions on the explore.org webpage where where perhaps this is is being streamed i'm not sure if there's a question feature on the the explore.org slash bear fund page uh, i believe not. i believe there is, is there one I there think, i think i saw and you can also today. use twitter yeah. and and use the hashtag ask ranger roy and um, what they will do is they collect those questions and then they forward us on to uh the questions on to this ipad and that's what mike and i are looking at uh periodically and we have uh, two questions waiting in the queue right now. The first one, uh, or the next one rather, is, Hi Rangers, have you seen 402 and her cubs the last few days? Uh, the la Well, I, I actually haven't. Um, 
last time I, I know that I saw her was last Wednesday night. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, Bear 4402, she's a, uh, a, a, a fairly popular bear on the webcam because she has three spring cubs, and those or, or cubs of the year, and those cubs were born this past winter in, uh, in January or February. So really they're no more than, than eight months old right now, nine months old right now. And I know I saw her last, uh, last Wednesday, she was right down here below the platform. And I got, I was out here just bear viewing in the evening and I had some really um, good bear watching opportunities with her right down beneath me. So she was around, uh, with her three cubs at that point in time. I'm not sure if we've seen, seen her since and that doesn't necessarily mean that she was got hurt or her cubs got hurt or anything like that. She may just be fishing out of our line of sight. So she may have found just maybe the fishing conditions are better upstream or maybe she's gone to a different salmon stream in the area because the Brooks River isn't the only place where bears can get salmon at this time of the year, although it's one of the best places at this time in, in the area for bears to get salmon. And I don't recall seeing her in the last few days either. But as Mike said, that, uh, you know, when we when we don't see a bear for a couple of days, that there's no reason for alarm there. They are off doing their own thing. And um, this time of the year, what they're doing is a lot of sleeping, which leads us to uh, sleeping and eating. Uh, the, the next question is, do bears dream? And don't you wish you knew the answer to that? If <laughs> I bet if they do, many, many of those recurring dreams that they have have to do with salmon. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Just thinking about salmon, more salmon, because it's such an important part of their diet. But uh, that that's a really good question. I mean, we're being sort of goofy about it, but uh, I suppose it's possible that somebody in some research center has put electrodes on a on a bear's brain and looked for the signs of of dreaming in the, in the brain waves. But who's to say that that they even would have the same brain activity that we have? So I don't know. Great question. I'm certainly going to take a look at that and see if anybody has detected that. You know, you see it in, you see what appears to be dreaming in dogs, but even with dogs, I'm not sure how similar it is to what we dream. But I'm going to go with my salmon dreams. That's what I imagine <laughs> that they're, that they're dreaming about. So again, if you want to post questions to us, keep them coming. We'll, we'll do our best to try to answer them for you. And uh, another question that just sort of came up here. Uh, I read that sows will wake up when their cubs are born. With the birth itself, will wake them up too. I th I think they maybe yeah they're probably uh they probably do wake up when when the when the cubs are actually born um but really they're not they're not doing too much um at that time uh, a bear giving birth isn't necessarily like a uh, uh like a like a human giving birth or other other animals because the cubs are actually extremely small in comparison Trying to, to get out of the shadow okay. here. <laughs> so extremely small in comparison to um to the mother itself this is a cast of a of a bear paw front paw from a bear and and there's my hand for comparison at birth the the cubs are going to be like maybe about that big they can they could rest on top of the mother's paw and still have a little bit of headroom and leg room they are they are tiny almost embryonic in their in their development they have a very short uh uh, gestation period so they're born very small and and then and then they uh, will will work their way over to a teat and begin nursing immediately and by the time so they weigh less than a pound typically at birth and by the time we see them down in locations like Brooks Camp in uh, June or July they may be 15 pounds so they put on a lot of weight and they've grown substantially larger but at birth incredibly small and so there probably isn't the distress that that other animals feel when they're when they're giving birth so uh the waking up happens to some degree but it's but it's not a prolonged traumatic thing birth with bears it's it's pretty you know pretty uneventful in most cases because of the size of the bear or the cub and they're born at the perfect time of the year of course uh, the, when they're if they were to be born right now for instance it would be a, a terrible time of the year because the cubs are so small and so vulnerable they can't move around and that would also um, you know put the mother at risk of maybe not surviving the winter time but when they're born in the middle of the den when she's sleeping and they can nurse for months until she goes out of the den that's the perfect time of the year for a bear cub to be born so they really have a remarkable timing within um, their to, to reproduce that allows them to to give the cubs the best opportunity to survive the next question is, who's controlling the cameras? Is it park rangers um, or can people volunteer to help? And the, uh, the camera operators are primarily volunteer 
camera operators that Explore.org recruits and trains and uh, and provides them the, the access to those cameras. These volunteers are scattered all over the country. Some of them have volunteered on some of Explore's other webcams. Some of them are new. And the way they get recruited, at least this last year for, for the webcams, is they made a couple of uh, announcements of postings on the Explore.org webpage asking for people that might be interested in, in controlling the cameras. And you have to agree to a few things like controlling up to nine cameras for you know several hours at a time. You have to make sure that you've got internet that can, can handle uh, that amount of, of data throughput and you also want to make sure your internet isn't capped at a very small amount so that you don't use up all of your internet the first day when you're trying to control the cameras. So they have, and, and there's a minimum speed too. So they have some requirements like that, give you some training and uh, some orientation materials, and then they, they schedule them to sign up for different times to control the cameras. So in the, um, in the in, you know, for the coming season, Explore may be recruiting for volunteers again, so I'd say just keep checking in on the Explore.org webpage in the spring and see if, if they are recruiting. And when they are, we'll also make some announcements on the Park Service pages too and let folks know that they would be looking for some more volunteers. Okay. And I think I got all the volunteer questions. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So let's I think they do a great <laughs> job. Um, you know, it's, it's particularly amazing to think that these people are controlling these cameras from all over the United States and um, I believe virtually none of them, maybe one of them, well I know one has been here, uh, but they, they've never been here. So they are able, they're volunteering of their time to this place that they haven't visited so that millions of people can, can enjoy the bears. And uh, I just think they do a great job, uh, you know, especially in light of the fact that they don't have the intimate feel for the lay of the land like, like people here would have. We can't control them because our internet isn't, isn't fast enough for or cheap enough for us to buy more internet. And so. frankly, I wouldn't be as good at it as most of the cam <laughs> operators. They have much more practice right. than me. I've tried, and it's pretty hard to do. So yeah, yeah, we yeah we've dabbled in it a couple of times, and <laughs> and they they deserve tremendous thanks from everybody watching the cameras, and, and they have our gratitude here at the park because they make this all possible. So um, another question here in our queue, um, and this has to do with bears' um, intelligence: Are bears as smart as wolves? And measuring the intelligence of an animal is, is very difficult because, of course, we can't give them an IQ test. But bears are thought to be um, very smart animals. Um, in fact, a lot of people who train bears for movies, that um, you'll see them, you know, maybe Bart the Bear, who's the most famous one. And I think that bear has, has died. And maybe there's another, a few other Hollywood bears that you might, you know, see in, in films recently. Uh, but a lot of the trainers who train those bears for Hollywood they say that you really only have to teach a bear something once and it's got it, especially if it's associated with food. You want to make the, the things that you want bears to do, you want to make that rewarding and, and, uh, and easy. And maybe there is a food reward associated with that. The things that you don't want them to do, you want to make sure that they just don't have the opportunity to do. Um, and that's what we try to do around here at Brooks Camp, especially because we do know that these animals are so smart. Uh, and I would say that I'd, I'd probably be willing to say that they they are at least as smart as domestic dogs, and domestic dogs in many cases are just as smart as wolves. And again, that's only my personal opinion, uh, of course. But we have to be very careful here at Brooks Camp to make sure that bears don't have the opportunity to ever get access to food or or play toys. And a play toy can be anything that we leave behind at all. It could be a jacket that we leave on the ground. Um, it could be a can of gasoline that is used in some of the boats or a plane or something like that. Um, a, a camera anything like that because once a bear again learns a trick and learns that either uh, food is associated with um, that item or it's just a fun thing to play with They're, they may try to get those things again and again and again and we, we want to make sure that we keep uh, the bears smarts focused on nature and we don't want them of course trying to focus their intelligence on getting things from us like food or play toys the the next question is, what is the best advice should one ever encounter a bear, say, while out camping? Well, the, the best thing is to, well, every place is a little bit different. So if you're getting ready to go backpacking or camping someplace, make sure you check with the, the, the local authorities in that area and see what they suggest for food storage, uh, for where to locate campsites, uh, places perhaps to avoid while you're, you're traveling. So check with the locals first and see, see what they're recommending. But as, as a general sense, what you want to do with, with bears is, is have a lot of distance between you and the bear. 
and what a lot is varies from place to place you know in in some interior parts of the of the the United States where you might encounter bears that don't have ready access to concentrated food sources where they are not habituated to the presence of other bears or habituated to the presence of people and by habituated I mean you know used to people being around they expect people to be around or they expect other bears to be around and they tolerate that close proximity to these other animals or, or people so uh, bears in the interior typically lead more solitary lives and so there for example you would want to have more space between you and a bear but Space is a really good thing because it gives the bear time to decide what it wants to do and you don't force an interaction where one doesn't need to be. So the ways you can make sure that the bear has space is try to travel in open country where possible so the bear can see you at a distance. Their eyesight's about as good as ours so they, they can see things coming and they may stand up and get a better look. That's not an aggressive thing, that's just curiosity. Uh, so. Travel where there's where there's good visibility so you can have space. Make some noise. You don't have to walk through the forest banging a drum or, or, or ringing a cowbell all the time. Uh, but usually in, in most situations, having uh, just conversations with the people you're traveling with, that's enough to, to let the bear know that you're there. Now, if it's really windy and the leaves are rustling or the grass is rustling or you're by a river or you're walking on a lake and you've got water from uh, noise from water you might have to make some more noise there but you're you know you're not trying to drive the bear in front of you like like it's a you know a, a cow and you're trying to hurt it you're just trying to alert this animal to your presence and uh, let's see da -da. don't travel with things that are very odorous and attractive bears like sweet things bears like salmon they like fish they like bacon you know so don't travel with a lot of food odors on you um, let's see got make noise got what am I missing uh, food, um, and making sure, you know, if you're camping, especially making sure that you don't attract, you have, don't have any attractions around your tent that would bring a bear into the area. Um, so cooking away from your campsite, for instance, storing your food away from your campsites, really prevention is the key. Uh, you want to really make sure that you're doing everything you can if you uh, to prevent close encounters with the bear. And in some places, that can be really difficult. If you come to Katmai, for instance, and you're walking along a salmon stream, you're kind of putting yourself in a position where you're going to have close encounters with bears. So you want to be extra careful in those situations. But definitely, I think the best advice is try to prevent those situations from happening in the first place. And maybe that could be just altering um, your travel plans accordingly. If there's, if you're going to an area where there's uh, known to be a lot of bears at a certain season and you're uncomfortable with that, maybe you want to go earlier in the year, you want to go later in the year, something like that. So you don't have, you have less of a chance of actually encountering them. And if you do get in a situation where you encounter one at close range, uh, you want to talk to the bear in a soft voice, let it know that you're humans, what you're doing at that point. And, and uh, they're, you know, they've, they've, they've been around humans for tens of thousands of years they they are wary of us in a general sense and sometimes they investigate trying to figure out what something is it doesn't quite smell right they don't have a good view maybe and so they investigate usually once they find out you're human they'll they'll turn and they'll go away so you'll talk to it in a soft voice uh, let it know you're human keep an eye on it you want to make sure that you don't lose it in the forest now this isn't like a stare like you're trying to get your dog to bark at you this is just keeping an eye on the animal you're watching it, it's watching you, and then to, to back away slowly. Again, it's increasing some distance there. You want to make sure that there's time uh, for reaction. If the bear does charge you, and uh, it gets so complicated, you know, you need to know if the bear is uh, if the bear is attacking, if the bear is bluff charging you. But generally, uh, with with a brown bear, you'll want to you'll want to probably play dead if it comes right up to you, right at the point where it's about to make contact. Don't just drop and play dead the second you see a bear. But again, all of this stuff, the best thing to do is to talk to the to the authorities in the area where you intend to go backpacking or, or for a hike. Pick up the brochures that are there and, and read those thoroughly and ask the questions when you're there. You know, I'm afraid in this situation, we, 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 we don't want to give you some information that would not be applicable, say, in Yellowstone or Glacier. So definitely check in with the locals before you before you head out to make sure you have the best information for that location. And I would, I would also add um, one final thing is to learn as much about bears as possible. The more you know about these animals, I think the easier it is 
for you to get an understanding of maybe their motivations if you do happen to encounter them when you're out hiking wherever you happen to be in a national park a national forest or maybe even in your hometown too because sometimes curious bears do come into town and you want to make sure that you're giving them uh, the space they need to 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 survive so learn as much about them as possible and that really has helped me become comfortable with the animals out here in Katmai, the more I know about them and their motivations and what, why they're doing certain things, then I can maybe uh, react in a consistent manner around them. And if bears learn that people behave in a consistent manner, then they learn to behave in a consistent manner around us. So the, jumping from that question, we have a specific one about one of the bears that we see frequently here on the cameras, and that is uh, Ted one of the favorites, Ted and Otis are, are right up there in the, at the top. Uh, is behavior such as Ted's begging and mooching learned from his mother or is it something he just started to do on his own? And uh, they learn a lot of their behaviors from, the, from their mothers, but I don't know that I have seen mothers teaching their cubs to beg. I don't have you seen no, that? No, no. Because they tend to, <laughs> mothers with cubs tend to be so wary of other bears that they, they keep their distance. But what I imagine happened is that uh, when Ted was a sub-adult, he was hanging around the edges of, of Brooks Falls or other places where bears were feeding and started picking up the scraps that were left because in the in in uh, July, especially when the, the salmon are coming in, there's more salmon than they can eat at any one time. So they will high grade. They will just strip the skin off, eat the brains, eat the eggs if it's a female, maybe the tail where there's a, a fat, a concentrated fat source and cast off the rest of it. So he may have started out just scavenging and got a little bit closer and, and, I don't know, developed some pretty mean begging skills. He, he is very successful at using that technique and hardly ever gets slapped around. And the bears aren't actively giving him fish because he's begging. He's maybe vocalizing, um, and I wish I could recreate it for you, but I'm not going to even try <laughs> because it's, it's certainly worth hearing. It's just a big, big bellow. That he, bellow. <laughs> yeah, that he makes. At the bears um, that are around him when he's doing that, he's probably learned that those other bears are tolerant of his presence, and that allows him to approach closely, uh, but they're not actively giving him fish. So bears aren't known to hold that capacity uh, for compassion or sharing or anything like that. So they're basically just going to finish their fish and let it drift downstream, and Ted, maybe by vocalizing like that, he you know gets in a position where he's likely to be able to pick up a lot of those scraps that are left behind it, but the other bears are certainly not giving him fish. It's effective in, in his case, but it also runs a, a high risk, you know, one swat up, uh, you know, to the side of his head could fracture his skull, his jaw, and then, then he would have problems. But it, it's been working for him for a number of years and it's certainly fun to watch. Uh, next question is how good is bears hearing? Could they hear the cameras clicking and zooming for instance? And, uh, their hearing is, is adequate. It's on par with ours, you know, perhaps a little bit better. And they do key in on noises that we make. They do hear, uh, cameras going. They hear when people inadvertently cheer when a bear catches a salmon or when a salmon makes it past a bear. You know, we, we tell people to remain quiet so they don't disturb the bears, but sometimes human nature just takes over and you go, yay, it got through. And, and the bears will sometimes stop and, and look at what we're doing. Uh, but the, the sense that, that they rely on the most is their sense of smell. That is their, their strongest sense, you know, better than a bloodhound's. And uh, you can read up about that. Uh, it's truly an amazing skill that they have. And one way you can, you can judge an animal's ability to to uh, detect scents is by the size of their nasal passages and the length of them and uh, so here's here's the nose the nasal passage and if this animal were alive there would be some bony structures inside of there designed to help capture and retain scents and and transmit them to the brain and um, and then the length of of it so when this animal was alive and this is from an adult bear uh, I, I don't know what cause of death for, for this bear, uh, but it, it's an adult bear from here in the park. Long nose filled with, with sensory apparatus that would allow it to collect those scents and, and, and transfer them to the brain. So that's, you know, that's their super powerful, superhuman ability that they have is that sense of smell. All right. So another another question in our queue here is, um, and I think this is about a, one of the Hollywood bears that we often see in movies. 
uh, the question or the person starts out by saying, I saw, I saw Brutus the bear once. That bear was amazing and does not seem at all violent. Is this because he grew up around humans or is this, this just his personality? Uh, and it's probably a little bit of both. Uh, in my opinion, I, I don't know that bear, so I don't want to necessarily um, speak for that animal because I don't have any personal experience with it. But different bears do have dis different di dispositions you could and different personalities. Um, they behave differently. Like a bear, like Ted, for instance, seems to be uh, much more tolerant of other bears near him. He'll play with other bears, even though he's an older adult bear and he's kind of in his late teens and we don't often see many of the bears his age playing with others but he certainly will um, still play so definitely personality and disposition has to do with it so maybe Brutus has a disposition that makes him more tolerant towards people but certainly um, it's because he is used to people as well too I mean right being raised as a cub and I think um, that bear was raised as or as a cub um, by um, by his trainer um, and, you know, being around people in a consistent manner and finding that people aren't an enemy necessarily, not a threat um, to them, not a competitor in any way, then, you know, bears have the ability to alter their behavior. And I think we've mentioned this before in other chats that bears, um, they can modify their behavior. Their behavior is plastic. So it's not set in stone. They can modif modify their behavior um, in a way that gives them the best advantage to survive. And in Brutus's case, the, if he was a very aggressive bear towards people, he wouldn't be, you know, doing what he's doing um, in life today. So, uh, you know, being tolerant of people, for instance, um, is allowing him, um, and being a smart bear, of course, and listening to instructions and everything like that. And there's a plane taking off, so I don't know if you're able to hear me, but, um, but yeah, that allows him to survive. And in his mind, that's the best survival strategy he has. I do well by my trainer and the people around me, then I'm going to get well fed. Um, and he's not necessarily doing it for, um, for a job because he likes it, but that's how he gets food. That's really how he makes his living. I've spoken in the past with a, a bear trainer who was out here and said that uh, it's a constant uh, battle of dominance with him. Not fighting, but the, the bear that he works with will always try to occupy the same space that he's occupying. And so it's just subtle, but always, <laughs> always just pushing around a little bit, uh, just nudging him here and there, leaning against him and pushing. And uh, he said it's just a, a constant battle to, to always let that animal know uh, that, that, you know, who the boss is. So uh, let's see, we have uh, one more question, and that is, where are the bears today? Well, that's it. We see bears over in the other direction. I know you can't see them on on this camera, and and maybe the um, maybe the, the the webcams can pick it up if they go upstream. But there are uh, bears above the oxbow. There's a bear at uh, an island just before the oxbow. We have names for everything here, so you know you can't look on a map and see the Big Island or Fiji or. You know, the names can be some, sometimes kind of goofy, but they tend to be short and names that we don't confuse on the radio when we're when we're communicating. And um, so I can see two bears right now that may be visible on the camera. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they, they're around. We had quite a delay this morning trying to get across the river. In fact, we almost missed our, our, our bear chat today because we were on the other side trying to get across and we had... Uh, three, maybe four different bears that had come through the area and kept the, the, the bridge closed, including those those two adults that were playing. Uh, there are a lot of bears around right now. So, you know, maybe they're not on the on the cams right now. Maybe the cams are, are just missing. Again, we can't really see at the moment what they're looking at, but there are definitely bears around. And if you want to see a lot of the bear or a lot of bears, tune in right around sunrise, which is here in Alaska that's uh, about... 7 30 um in the morning so if you are in the east coast that's going to be four hours ahead um keep talking Mike. yeah so so uh, yeah there's a bear right below us now so yeah, they're definitely they're definitely around for sure but uh, overnight salmon will continue so, to spawn and they'll continue right to die and they'll drift downstream and they'll collect in the eddies and side channels and out in the uh, of the the mouth near the mouth of the river and they'll collect in the lake as well, too. And the bears wake up in the morning and they're hungry. So in the mornings, it tends to be a very busy time in um, September and October right here 
around Brooks Camp, and that's a great opportunity to see a lot of different bears. Not only um, you know big adult males, but you'll find females with cubs. You'll find um, younger bears, juvenile bears like subadults, like the one that Roy um, was trying to show you just a little bit ago. Yeah, I don't know how clear that was, and I think we're an inset in a in a picture, so it probably wasn't big enough. It's kind of unfortunate timing because one of the things that we wanted to do here at the very end was just go down and stand on the ground and let you look back up at the platforms, and maybe the bear will cooperate and move out of the way here in a second. We know that for you know going on two seasons now, or concluding two seasons now, you've been watching the bears from up here looking out, and we thought we might give you the the chance to look back on the on the platform. We couldn't really do it up at the falls last week, but but we can do it here if that bear moves on just a little bit more. Uh, we did have another question though, and that is, uh, are we going to do any more of these live chats? I believe so. Uh, I think there's another one uh, in conjunction with Disney Nature that might be on the in the works for next Wednesday, and I'm not, not sure if it'll be the same time or not. And uh, that one will be in King Salmon because Mike and I will not be out here next week. But we haven't confirmed this and finalized it yet, so maybe this is putting explore.org on, on the hook. And um, But I would like to do one before we leave. One of the last things that we, we do, I hope, would be one of these bear chats on Monday, which is when Mike and I will be packing up and heading out. So uh, keep keep watching the Facebook pages and explore.org and, and your Twitter feeds, and maybe there'll be an announcement from us that we'll be doing at least one of these next week, hopefully two, hopefully one on Monday, the last chance to see this place before, before Mike and I leave for the season. And, and if that works, we'd like to give you a, sh uh, a view of what it looks like beyond the corner here. You know, for all this time, people have been watching bears disappear around this point here. They come, you know, this, this out there is the lake and then the bears come around this gravel bar and disappear that heads back toward the visitor center and the ranger station and what we'd like to do is to set the camera up over there and give you a view of that area and uh, maybe there'll be some bears around uh, maybe not you know who knows it depends what the weather's doing and, and how many dead fish there are on the beach but that's one thing that we'd like to do is is to do that and and show you a different area and then almost immediately we're on the plane and we're heading out of here brooks camp uh Officially closed today. The last of the the lodge guests will be flying out around five o'clock, and the park service is already busy closing up camp, putting boards on buildings, and getting everything winterized. And for about the next three and a half weeks or so, there will be maintenance workers and uh, a, a few people from bear management and and uh, law enforcement person or two out here. Uh, keeping tabs on the place until it's it's all boarded up and, and, and everybody moves out. And typically we are out of here on October 15th or so. And uh, the cams, we hope, will still be running. We've given them good power supplies this year. We've increased the solar capacity. Last year, without those enhancements, we went till the first few days of November. This year, we're hoping, crossing our fingers, that we can go much further and provide that really rare opportunity to be here and see when the bears actually disappear. And that'll be something all of you can help us with because uh, we have to move out, like I said, in the middle of October, the last of us leave because it starts to really turn winter here. The lake freezes, you can't fly float planes anymore, etc. Uh, but the bear cams will give us that incredible opportunity to watch this area, hopefully well into November until the last of the bears are seen. We got pretty far last year, but we're hoping we can we can get further this year. And um, if we can take just one more minute, I think uh, the bears have moved a little bit uh, further away from us and we can step down onto the ground and then maybe um, point the camera here up to uh, up to the webcam so you can get a better idea of where they are mounted on on our platforms here so so let me um, let me see where are the bears today I want to make sure that we don't miss a question okay, okay. so the last thing I want to say is when we take this uh, laptop down and we walk down below and show you this there is the possibility that we could get disconnected because of a, a Wi-Fi dead spot that we're not sure of we haven't tried this before in case that happens thank you so much for tuning in again for this chat yes, thanks thank for you. all the great questions and um, we're gonna do our best to try to have one of these next week and I uh, hope that you can all tune in and, and have the wonderful questions ready for us. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and disconnect yeah. here and, and take a walk down and see, see if we can show you the platform. Try not to make people seasick as we're walking.
Okay, so we are underneath the bear viewing platform, and uh, right up there is one of the the cameras, which you can see right up there. That's one of the cameras that looks around in various directions. Now we'll walk out here a little ways. There's so, one, one bear upstream of the bridge now. So, but... so unfortunately, the sun is kind of in the way, right behind it. Let's go over to this side, and then here's the the view that you're mostly used to seeing from and you can see the the camera right on the edge of the platform there and this that's the lower river camera the other one the one that's backlit by the sun that's the lower river east camera and those are going to be the primary cameras that you'll be watching this fall so uh, keep tuning in and uh, keep leaving those questions and comments on the website and Mike and I will do our best to try to answer those uh, in the coming days and weeks yeah, I am often um, chatting in the comments section on explore.org, and I try to do that um, a couple times a week at least. So look for me on there, and I try to advertise when I'll be on there using Twitter and Facebook. So I try to be on there a few hours a week at least to answer your questions on there. So um, please look for me there as well. Okay, we're right at an hour, actually a little bit more. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time. All right. Goodbye, Bye. everyone.